For two decades, it was universally accepted that the 1996 Bulls were the greatest NBA team of all time. But then the 2017 Warriors entered the chat, a team that had just won 73 games, added Kevin Durant. Behind the back, Durant. Two Durant. With two league MVPs, a defensive player of the year, and the best two-way shooting guard in the game, the Warriors obliterated every team in the NBA, setting the best playoff record in NBA history. But did Kevin Durant's titles with Golden State certify his place among the top 10 players ever? And are the 2017 Warriors really the best team of all time? Obviously, we will never know, but if you put us on paper with them, I like our chances. In the last 10 years, it's not difficult to say who was the best organization in the NBA. From the team owner to the cleaning lady, there is no better organized franchise than the Golden State Warriors. In 2023, the Warriors were worth $7.7 .7 billion, twice as much as the average NBA franchise. Other than the Dallas Cowboys, the Warriors are the most valuable sports franchise in the world. And if someone predicted this back in 2010, you'd call them insane. Back then, the Warriors were almost a laughingstock, a fun little squad that rarely made the playoffs and the fourth best team in California. Until Joe Lacob bought the team for $450 million and everything changed. Lacob immediately started making big moves, firing legendary coach Don Nelson, trading then-dubs best player and crowd favorite Monte Ellis, and hiring inexperienced Bob Myers as general manager. All three moves were extremely unpopular with the Oakland fan base, but Lacob and Myers soon proved to be three steps ahead of everyone else when it came to building a winning team. If you look up there, that is a very lonely flag. We want another one. While the new GM did inherit the best shooter of all time, Myers immediately tied Steph to a team-friendly contract. He'd then go on to draft Klay Thompson, Harrison Barnes, and Draymond Green. In 2014, Myers hired Steve Kerr and brought in impactful vets like Andrew Bogut, Andre Iguodala, and Sean Livingston. In their first season under Coach Kerr, the Warriors ran circles around everybody with hectic pace and unbelievable shooting from their star backcourt, doing what seemed unimaginable just a few years ago, winning the 2015 NBA Championship. Boy, we did it. We did it. We did it. We did it. So happy for you. In 2016, the league didn't get the memo on how to catch up with the Warriors, and they set the new NBA record for wins in the regular season, with 73 wins and just 9 losses. However, burdened by chasing the record, the dubs ran out of steam and were defeated in the 2016 Finals. But this loss proved to be a blessing in disguise. Because they weren't crowned champions, and because of an enormous spike in salary cap thanks to a new NBA TV deal, the Warriors were able to sign Kevin Durant, universally recognized as the second best player on the planet. The whole world called KD a coward, a traitor, a snake, a cupcake, and God knows what else. Well, I'm viewing it as the weakest move I've ever seen from a superstar. Plain and simple, that's just how I look at it. But the truth was that KD needed the Warriors, and the Warriors needed him. When the 2017 season started, the Warriors were virtually unbeatable, cruising through the season without any problems. KD was incorporated seamlessly into the Warriors' offense, and Kerr didn't have to find weird strategies for their four stars to share the ball. KD played the most unselfish basketball of his career because, for the first time ever, he didn't have to score a single point and his team could still win the game. Golden State won 67 games, with the highest offensive rating in NBA history, second best defense in the league, and the third best net rating in NBA history. It seemed like the Warriors turned on the PlayStation, entered a cheat code, and played the entire season in God mode. They made it through the playoffs without losing a single game, sweeping all three of their series in the West. And then, in the finals, a familiar opponent awaited, LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers. The defending champs had been uber-dominant themselves, losing just one playoff game on their road to the finals. But unlike the 2015 and 2016 finals, where LeBron was by far the best player on the court, the Warriors had the perfect antidote to King James, KD. Not only did Durant bring in an offensive dimension to the Warriors that they didn't have before, but he also brought a defensive presence, and his mobility as a near seven-footer made it difficult for James to drive to the basket at will. In the first two games, the Warriors obliterated the Cavs. Turnovers created unsolvable problems for Cleveland, as they gave up numerous easy points to the Warriors' insane Durant pace. Down the lane. 
But even when all five Cavs managed to get on defense on time, they were murdered with the Durant-Curry pick and roll. The Cavs had a potent offense, but the Dubs' ability to knock down three-pointers in succession hit Cleveland like an avalanche. In all 77 years of NBA history, there wasn't a team that could switch on the turbo quite like that and increase a two-point lead to 20-plus in three minutes. However, when the series returned to Cleveland for Game 3, the Cavs looked much better, and their offense kept them in the lead for much of the game. It seemed like LeBron and company would win the game and keep the series alive. But then, in the final minute, KD launched one of the most cold-blooded shots in NBA Finals history. Durant for three. It's good! Kevin Durant from downtown! And Golden State takes the lead! Cleveland still had a chance to win it, but suddenly, they couldn't buy a bucket, and they didn't score a single point in the final three minutes. The Warriors won the game, snatching a 3-0 series lead. Then, the Cavs somehow managed to win Game 4, in what was arguably the best offensive game ever in the finals, hitting 24 threes, an NBA playoff record. But it was clear to everybody that they couldn't sustain that kind of shooting and win the ring against these Warriors. In Game 5, Golden State finished the job, finishing the playoffs with 16 wins and only one loss, which was the best postseason run in NBA history. There it is! Redemption for Golden State! One of the great playoff runs of all time is complete! KD finally won that first title that had eluded him for so long. He averaged an unreal 35.2 points, 8.6 rebounds, 5.2 assists, 1 steal, and 1.6 blocks per game, while shooting 56% from the field, 47% from three, and 93% on free throws. It was one of the best finals performances of all time. And, of course, KD won the finals MVP. And yet, despite Durant's and Golden State's greatness, the basketball world wasn't impressed. A lot of people enjoy seeing y'all lose in 2016. And a lot of those people were upset that we were so good. Mm -hmm. And they're still upset. When KD joined the Warriors, it was kind of expected that they should win. And their championship looked too easy. They had two MVPs on their team a reigning Defensive Player of the Year, and Klay Thompson, the best two-way shooting guard in the NBA. All of them were an average age of 27, which is considered a prime for basketball players. Add Iguodala, Sean Livingston, David West, JaVale McGee, and Zaza Pachulia, all playing phenomenal basketball off the bench, and then you have an absolute juggernaut. Their offense had so many systematic solutions and so much talent that defenses had to pick their poison. Either give up a wide-open dunk or let three of the best shooters ever have an open shot. Golden State's defense was mobile and super connected. They created a lot of turnovers and killed opponents in transition. Sure, they didn't have a dominant post scorer, and if they faced a top talent on the low block like Prime Shaq, that would certainly give them problems. But given the style of play and the state of the league in 2017, those were minimal flaws. However, it's one thing to dominate, and it's a whole different ball game to become a dynasty. We know how tough it's going to be. We know how hard it is to be the best team in the league. I think we're all ready for that challenge. And in 2018, this unbelievable Warriors team had a tougher road than anyone expected. They won 58 games in the regular season. Their defense dropped out of the top 10 best in the league, and overall, they didn't look as smooth and connected as they did the year before. Injuries played their part. But still, the Dubs had so much talent that they easily won the first round against the Spurs, despite Curry not playing. In the second round, Steph returned, and they defeated the Pelicans in five games, securing a matchup that every NBA fan hoped for, a clash with the number one seeded Rockets and the league MVP, James Harden. The Rockets built their whole roster to be able to match up with the Warriors. And suddenly, Golden State's players looked mortal again. Houston pushed the Warriors out of their comfort zone by slowing down the pace as much as possible, with an average possession lasting 18 seconds. They also attacked the Warriors one-on-one -on -one to avoid double teams, and they killed the dubs on the glass with their offensive rebounding. But whenever Kerr had faced a deficit in any game, he simply used the death lineup, which no team had an answer for except for Houston. With P.J. Tucker at center and long defenders at the wings, the Rockets neutralized the best five-man lineup in NBA history with their own version of small ball. With dominant switch defenses, the Rockets shut down Golden State's motion offense and forced them to attack through isolations, which put Splash Brothers in discomfort for much of the series. After five games, the Rockets had a 3-2 lead, and it seemed like the Warriors' dynasty was in serious jeopardy. That's the first one. Except, in the final moments of Game 5, Chris Paul got hurt, 
and was ruled out for the series. Game 6 was a blowout, with the Warriors winning by 29, and everybody expected the same result in Game 7. And yet, the Rockets started the deciding game playing out of their minds. Houston had an 11-point lead at the half, and it looked like David could somehow beat Goliath. But then, the Warriors hit that turbo button again and hit a series of threes to turn the game around. The game was still close until the end, but then the Rockets missed 27 threes in a row, and it was all over. The Dubs made another final, and for the fourth straight year, they faced LeBron and the Cavs. But this time, King James was without Kyrie, and it was a miracle that he even made the finals, because it looked like he was playing with some bystanders that he picked up on the street on his way to the arena. However, in Game 1, LeBron proved that he is one of the GOATs by scoring 51 points. Fast Curry gets inside and throws it down! Only for J.R. Smith to forget the score of the game in the final moments and pass up a potential game-winning shot. I look at Bron, Bron look pointing like this. <laughs> oh, the f is he pointing at? <laughs> I look over, oh, man. And then after that, I was just like, I know this shit ain't just happened. Not in the finals. <laughs> After that, it was all over, and the Warriors' next title was a walk in the park as they swept the Cavs. The only close game was Game 3, which was again clinched by a Kevin Durant deep three, from virtually the same spot as the year before. Kevin Durant way outside, delivers! Kevin Durant from downtown, it's a six-point game! With 29 points, 11 rebounds, 7 assists, and over 2 blocks per game, and 50-40-90 shooting splits, Durant deservedly won another Finals MVP. It's incredible. It's, it's good for you to be around guys like this. It helps you become a better basketball player and a better man. And this is a journey that's better than a destination. You know, I'm happy I'm a part of this group. But after the Finals, a familiar feeling was felt. Nobody was impressed. Everybody expected the Warriors to win again. And in 2019, this feeling started to creep into the Warriors themselves. They seemed to be just going through the motions. And for the first time in the Kerr era, the Dubs started to have chemistry problems. In a close game against the Clippers, Draymond took the ball and refused to pass it to KD, messing up the play completely and losing the game. Instead of saying, my bad, Draymond went berserk, cussing out Durant and telling him that he could leave the team. Durant was in his contract year, and he wasn't entirely happy in Golden State anymore. Communication is key. Like I, We didn't show that, and that, that's what rubbed me the wrong way more than anything. After this incident, Draymond got suspended by the team, but their chemistry issues were never solved. They told me right then and there, like, we're going to suspend you for this game. I laughed in their face, literally laughed in their face. However, Golden State was still the NBA royalty, with more talent than any other team. Still, their infamous motion offense got more stagnant, and Durant didn't buy into the team concept as much as before. Instead, he began playing like he did in OKC, using his otherworldly basketball talent to score in isolation. But because he was KD, it worked, and the Warriors were winning. I'm Kevin Durant. You know who I am. Y'all know who I am. <laughs> they got past the Rockets again, far easier than last time, despite losing Durant to injury after Game 5. KD wouldn't play a second of the conference finals, but the Dubs still swept Portland and got to the finals for the fifth consecutive year. But against the Raptors, which were led by Kawhi Leonard and were far more talented than any team the Dubs faced that year, the Warriors were in trouble. With Draymond completely losing faith in his shot, an aging Iguodala and Livingston, and a thin bench, Golden State was suddenly lacking firepower. After four games, they were losing 3-1 and were on the brink of a loss. If they wanted to have any shot at another title, they desperately needed KD. So, despite still nursing the calf injury, Durant finally suited up. First four games, the Raptors were dominant and lead three games to one. But all of a sudden, Golden State has a new addition. Kevin Durant will play. And for the first quarter of Game 5, it looked like the Warriors were back. With Durant in the lineup, the Raptors couldn't throw all their defenders at Steph, and Golden State's offense was breathing again. Defensively, KD was a huge help too, and was one of the rare guys who could match up with Kawhi one-on-one. -on -one. But the dream of defending the title lasted for 14 minutes. Early in the second quarter, Durant tried to drive by Serge Ibaka when he heard a pop and fell to the floor. His Achilles was gone, and he knew it immediately. The Warriors somehow won Game 5, but without Durant, and then also Klay Thompson, who tore his ACL in Game 6, their season was over and the Raptors were the new NBA champs.
But while it's true that Durant came to an already built team, a winning team, this series perfectly showed how important he was for the Warriors and how much they needed him to win championships. While many will discredit KD's legacy because he won his only two championships on Steph Curry's team, it was clear that Durant was the best Warriors player. KD was always considered a phenom because he was a seven-footer with the athleticism, ball handling, and shooting ability of a guard. He was always a scoring machine. But it was when he joined the Warriors that he became a complete player and one of the best to ever touch a basketball. When he played in Oakland, KD was in his athletic prime, packing 30 more pounds of muscle than when he got drafted, and about 10 pounds more than he has now, because he's had to shed some weight after his Achilles injury to avoid getting injured again. While his basketball growth stagnated in OKC, when he got to the Warriors, Durant had added something new to his game each season. He became more comfortable moving without the ball in year one, completely buying into the Warriors' motion offense with lots of screens and cuts. Durant became a phenomenal defender in year two, averaging a career-high 1.8 blocks per game. In fact, before he got injured and missed the last two months of the regular season, he was in strong consideration for Defensive Player of the Year. And finally, he became a better playmaker in year three averaging a career-high 5.9 assists per game, which was more than Curry, who was the team's point guard. Durant's feel for the game had grown by leaps and bounds, and while he was known primarily as a scorer, a team could now run the whole offense through him as point forward, similar to LeBron. And just like LeBron perfected his game and made it complete in Miami, Durant did the same thing in Golden State. They were both ostracized because of their decisions, they both won two championships with their new teams, and ultimately, they both became the best players in the world. It's a bit of a shame that just when KD finally took that crown from LeBron, he got injured. If he stayed healthy, the Warriors would have probably defeated the Raptors, and KD would win three finals MVP in a row a feat achieved only by Michael Jordan and Shaq. The Warriors had weaknesses that could be exploited before Durant arrived, and he gave them an answer for everything. He was everything we could have asked for. Uh, he represented us on the court, he represented us off the court. In his three playoff runs with the Warriors, KD averaged 37-5 on 50-40-90 shooting while playing great defense. Durant was the one who coined the term unicorn when talking about Kristaps Porzingis, meaning that he's a seven-footer who can do everything on the floor. But it is still Durant himself who is the best unicorn in basketball history. And while many will criticize the Warriors for adding Durant to a team that won 73 games the year before, it's undeniable that this group was one of the best teams of all time, along with the Bulls in 96, the Celtics in 86, and the Lakers in 01. And for more content on all things NBA, keep watching nonstop.